All right, now, whatever it is you might have been thinking when we were reading Psalm 104, you probably don't know what we're going to be preaching about this morning. We started off in Psalm 104, it's because a good place to start, it's just kind of part of my first point. Um, Psalm 104, verse 15 says, And wine, this is talking about all the things that God does, and, and his, his creation, and how the animals wait on him for the food and things like that. But verse 15 says, And wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil to make his face to shine, and bread which strengtheneth man's heart. Now what I'm going to be preaching about this morning is when the Bible talks about wine. And, and what it's referring to. Now here we see a very positive reference to wine. And there's a lot of people today, I believe, that, that misunderstand when the Bible uses the word wine, what is it talking about? Is it always talking about what we know today to be wine, where you go down the liquor aisle and, and, you, and you have the alcoholic beverages? Is that always what it is? Is it consistent all the way through the Bible? Or does it possibly mean something else? Because I'm, I'm telling you today, it, there's two meanings for the word wine in the Bible. And I'm going to prove that to you this morning. We're going to go through various um, illustrations, various examples, and scriptural references to prove my point. But first, I just want to point off right off the bat that there are positive mentions and there are negative mentions of wine itself in the Bible. We started off reading, hey, wine that maketh glad the heart of man. Doesn't sound like a bad thing at all. Hey, it makes men's hearts glad, right? And, and then he follows that up with oil to make his face to shine. Is there anything wrong with oil? You know, people making their face to shine? No, of course not. And in this context, is there anything wrong with the wine? No, not at all. We see also, you don't have to turn there, but in Genesis 14, when uh, Melchizedek met with Abraham, he brought wine and bread. And he was considered the high priest. I'll quote that verse for you. He says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. So the, the priest of God is bringing wine and bread. Obviously, you're not going to say, Well, that's sinful, that's wrong, he had that wine. No. Um, but we have to understand what, what the wine is talking about, what, what kind of wine it is. And then in Proverbs 3, verse 9, the Bible says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. And again, it's talking about a blessing, having your, your, your presses uh, burst out with new wine. Now, these are all very positive mentions of wine in the Bible. And there's, there's others. I just picked three just to, just to start off, to give us examples. See, when the Bible's talking about this, what is it talking about? Well, let's look, first of all, turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Because we're going to see some negative. And what you're going to notice when we look at these examples is the stark contradiction of how, in one case, the wine is talking about is really good and it's a great blessing and, it, and it's, you know, brings a lot of joy and happiness. And then on, on the other end is just a, almost a total polar opposite extreme of wine. So we're in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and we're going to start reading in verse number 29 of Deuteronomy 32. The Bible reads, Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. How should one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight, except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up? For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the, of the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Amen. Look at this. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Now here, the, you know, the Bible is bringing up um, a, um, a difference between, well, I guess we could say, you know, the world and the people who are not trusting in the Lord. It says their rock is not as our rock. They're trusting in false gods. And one of the differences they point out, look, their wine is the poison of dragons. Yeah. You know, our wine, those of us that serve the Lord, you know, in in this context, will be the wine that makes glad the heart of men. This is going to be the wine that your presses are going to be burst out with new wine, and, and that's, that's a joy. If this is talking about the same exact thing, just to say, like, if, if just imagine today I had a cup just full of wine. 
And it's just, I mean, wine's an inanimate object, right? It, it is what it is. And you see the Bible describing this, saying, you know, this makes glad the heart of man. This is a great thing. It's a blessing. But then you also see, okay, this is the poison of dragons, the cruel venom of asps. Would it even make sense that it's the same exact thing being, being referenced here? Or does it make a little bit more sense to say, well, no, there's actually two cups. And that's why it says, their wine right. yeah. that's exactly right. is the poison of dragons. Their wine. It's a, it's a separate thing. Uh, we have our wine. Our wine's good. Their wine is poison. Their wine is venom. Their wine will kill you. And wine that we know today that contains alcohol is a poison. Yeah. Alcohol poisons your body. It is not good for you. And, and I don't care what any of these studies say. They do these stupid studies that say, well, if you drink wine, if you drink alcohol every day, you're going to live longer and stuff. That's, that's hogwash. And when you look at the, the actual studies, too, and what they do is they, they come out with these studies to make the headline to influence the way that you think about things. And it's not until you actually you really dig in and, do, and look at the studies when you start to realize, I can always think of all these other variables. It's like they take a group of people, say a thousand people, and then you just see one of the ones I saw is like, well, these people who didn't drink, they just died more you know, earlier than these other people. As if, and you know, out of a thousand people, as if now there's just causation there immediately. Without any respect to anything else in their life. As if the, just that one factor of drinking alcohol, now that's the determining factor of whether or not you're going to live longer or not. It, it, it's, it's ridiculous. Yet they'll, they'll tout some of these studies and say, and you know, and there's, there's no way, and I don't care, I understand statistics and I can't stand the way they do studies. This is just a little side note. Most of these studies, they don't know what they're talking about. That's why you have a new study coming out every year saying something different. Right. Say, oh, well, now we know this. Well, now we know that. Because you have researchers getting paid, getting grants or whatever. They need to keep on coming up with more studies and coming up with more findings. And they need to keep that money flowing or whatever. I mean, there's lots of different incentives for their studies. Or you got corporations that want to sell a product and they want it to look good. So there's going to be studies. I mean, whatever. There's, there's lots of motivations. Even people who are just completely honest... The science isn't, isn't that, you know, solid to be, to be standing on anyways with, with a, the vast majority of these studies that you hear about. And um, a lot of people don't quite understand the statistics and the different variables and stuff that are involved in order to make these determinations. So I don't, I don't care what some study says that, that alcohol is good for you. It's a poison. And that's been known for a long time, and that's a fact. That's a scientific fact, and that's a biblical fact. And I'm not going to get into all the science of wine, because it doesn't really matter. We've got what the Bible says is the truth about wine, and we're going to read about that this morning. What I'll be preaching against is the, the alcoholic beverage. And I don't think that any Christian should ever be touching a drop of alcohol. Amen. I think we need to stay away from it, avoid it, and um, just make sure it's completely out of your life. Now, turn if you would to, um, turn if you would to Song of Solomon. You're in, I had you in Deuteronomy. Turn if you would to Song of Solomon, because I want to, we're going to be in chapter 8. We're going to be flipping around a little bit this morning, because there's a lot of references I, I want you to see for yourself. Because here's what I'm presenting to you this morning, that the good wine from the Bible is juice. We know it as juice. It's, it's unfermented. It's non-alcoholic. It's just straight juice. If you were to go and take a, a, a vine of grapes and squeeze them into a glass, you have juice. And the reason why that's also called wine is because the, the, you know, the, the, the term is just coming from the, the juice of a, of, a, of a grape. And wine was just used... As the, as the word to describe that liquid that comes out of a, of a, out of a fruit, right? Or, or whatever you're juicing. And that's, um, that's the name that was given to it regardless of the alcohol content. Regardless of, of the fermentation process or how long it sits, that's just the name that was given to it. So what we have to do is determine from the context, and it's not hard to do. When the Bible's talking about wine in the Bible... You could read it from context. What type of wine is it talking about? Is this something that contains alcohol or not? And just the fact that there is such a huge, con you know, a huge contradiction right. 
Either the Bible's just just completely off its rocker and say, well, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, and we have no idea what the difference is. Or that's not the case, and it actually means something why it's, why it's completely opposite one versus other. Why in one case it's a poison of dragons, in the other case it, it makes a, the heart of man glad. So you're in Song of Solomon, chapter 8. Look at verse number 2. The Bible says, I would lead thee and bring thee into my mother's house who would instruct me. I would cause thee to drink of spiced wine of the juice of my pomegranate. So that definition I just gave about wine, this is where I'm getting it from. Drink of spiced wine of the juice of my pomegranate. So they're saying here, and this is the only time, mind you, that juice, that word juice is used in the Bible. And I believe it's just used here because it wasn't very commonly used at all. And it would make, it, it doesn't sound very good to say, drink of the spiced wine of the wine of my pomegranate. It would be really redundant. So oftentimes the Bible will use synonyms for words when they're used right next to each other. So it just doesn't kind of sound silly, right? Um, but we can, we can use that because it's using these words synonymously. Cause thee to drink of spiced wine of the juice of my pomegranate. It's talking about the juice that comes from a pomegranate. And here it's talking about wine from a pomegranate. It's not just talking about grapes or, you know, like that's the only source of wine. It comes from all different kinds of, of fruits and, you know, um, making these drinks, these beverages. Uh, turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah 65, just a little bit forward in your Bible. Isaiah 65. And let's look at verse number 8 of Isaiah 65. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants' sakes, that I may not destroy them all. Here it's talking about new wine that's found in the cluster. If, if juice is found, like, I mean, you have a cluster of grapes growing on a vine. That has not started the fermentation process at all, if it's still on the, in the cluster. And it's talking about the wine that's in that cluster. This is the good wine. This is the wine. That's, and that's why it says, destroy it not, a blessing is in it. That's a good thing. That new wine that comes out of the cluster is great. Now, turn if you would to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 20. I've, I've heard the argument against this, and I just started researching and reading about it last night. Because I don't like going very extra biblical in my teaching. I like staying pretty much with, the, with God's word. This is what we care about. This is what we know is the truth. And I'm proving this just from the Bible, how one wine is good and one wine is bad, and we need to stay away from the wine that's bad. But I've heard, I've heard even Christians say, well, you know what? Being able to preserve juice that doesn't become fermented is a new thing. They say they weren't even able to do that back in Jesus' day. So it wasn't even possible. And I've never accepted that argument without even doing the research on it. I looked it up last night, and that is just patently false. I was looking up. There's, there, are, there are other literature sources. There are people who has nothing to do with the Bible from the first century A.D. of, of someone who's writing a book on like agriculture and just in preserving stuff and, and being able to preserve food. And in that is juice as well. And just because the methods that they used are not what we use at all today. Today we have refrigeration. Today we have other things. And they're saying, well, see, look, they didn't have refrigeration back then, so they had no way of preserving this stuff. But there are plenty of textual sources that show that they absolutely did. And if you think about it, you know, people, it, it's, it's part of this mentality of, well, mankind has been so stupid because we came from the Neanderthal. Yeah. That, oh, 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 and you know, he's pounding on a rock one day, and you know, like that's how man was, and all of a sudden we just started to get a little bit smarter, and then we invented writing and reading, you know, just out of nowhere. And the wheel, wow, the wheel, that just revolutionized everything. And it's this, this false paradigm that they want to have stuck in your head that just because people lived a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago that they must have just been really stupid. Yeah. Because you know what? We're so smart. Yeah. You know, it's, it's this haughty attitude yeah. 
It's the same thing you see, like, oh, America's the best nation, and, and the people that view the people here as just like far superior to anyone else in any other part of the world because we're so smart and we're so great. And, you know, yet you look at the moral decay and the, the open, open arms of sodomy and filthiness and wickedness and adultery and just say, and, and just claim we're so smart. We're so wise. We're wise in our own conceits as a country, as a whole. Not as a church, but, <laughs> but as a whole, that's what it's, and, and it's, this, it's this false mentality of thinking, well, we are just so, because <laughs> they didn't even have air conditioning back then, or, you know, something stupid like that. Some little piece of technology that we have today, some little device that you can look at and, and sink your face into for hours on end and just think of how brilliant we are, that we can waste tons of time with a device, not talking to anybody, and just wasting our life away as opposed to the things that they did back then. And what I say is, you know what? People have always been intelligent because God created us with a brain. God created us with ingenuity. God created us to be able to do things. Their technology was different than ours today. As the culture changes, as different needs change, you're focused on different things. I believe they were probably far superior in their agriculture and husbandry than we are today. Definitely. Because that is something that was extremely important to them when there was a lot more reliance on their surroundings and their environment than today, now we've got a lot, a lot of manufacturing that we rely on today. It's, just, it's different. So you see the, the, the change in the, the um, advancements more in the technology side because we're using these other tools to do things for us that they didn't use back then, but they had other methods. And they understood things a little bit better. I, I personally believe they understood things better yeah. about the preservation of food and about the preservation of drinks and things like that than we do today. And that just, it just makes sense to me. Now, look, I'm going to get off of that subject because, like I said, I want to get back to the Bible. I had you turn to Proverbs, right? Because none of that even matters. We can see, you, this, is, this is an open and shut case from the Bible. So when, when, when I heard that argument in the past, without even knowing like, like the history and the that, you know, like, like doing all the research into it, it just, I knew it was wrong. Because the Bible is so clear on this issue that there's two different types of wine that there's, there's no way that everybody, that they all had to be drinking fermented wine, that that was the only way they could have done it. And, and I'll, by the time I'm done with the sermon, you'll see that that is false. And it's actually blasphemy. We'll get to that. It's going to be my last point. You'll see why that, that's because there's a case where that would be extremely blasphemous. Yeah. Okay. But let's, let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Proverbs chapter 20, verse number one, the Bible says, wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Hey, if you're deceived by alcohol this morning, you are not wise. Yeah. Turn if you want to Proverbs 23. Now what I want to start doing here is proving that drunkenness is a sin. Just drunkenness. Forget about drinking. I, I've said this earlier. No Christian should even touch alcohol at all. Not one beer, not one glass of wine, nothing. But we're going to start by moving over a little bit, a little bit more extreme and saying, okay, drunkenness is a sin. You should never be drunk. No Christian has any business getting drunk. Amen. And we'll prove this first and then we'll kind of move backwards and I'll show you all the reasoning behind it. Proverbs 23, look at verse number 19. The Bible reads, Hear thou my son and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. So here is, I mean, this is just giving some wisdom about being a drunkard. It's going to bring you to poverty. Yeah. If you're just focused on the alcohol and getting your next drink, that's where you'll be spending all your paycheck on. And look, I know, besides the being in the Bible, I know about all this stuff firsthand. Okay, this is a sin that I've dealt with personally in my life. And this is something that I feel very strongly about because it had such an impact on me. And I'll probably preach on this more often than a lot of other people do because I know the damaging effects of having alcohol in your life and you need to stay away from it. It's going to ruin your life. You may think it's not a big deal. I just have a drink every now and then. Oh, I just relax. No. Stay away from it. The, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I know we're flipping around a lot today, but you, we need to see a lot of these I want you to see for yourself. 
So we saw in Proverbs 23, be not among winebibbers. And that's not who your company should be. Your friends shouldn't be winebibbers. People are just going out to the bar all the time and drinking alcohol and drinking booze. That's not who you want to be around. Because it's going to rub off on you. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're proving drunkenness is a sin. Now you could say, well, that's just wisdom, you know, not to be drunk and stuff. Okay, fair enough. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse number 9. The Bible reads, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. Now are these sins, fornication, idolatry, adulterers? Yeah. Yes. Nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So here we see drunkards in that list of sins that if you've saved, you've been washed from. Amen. You're clean from those sins. Those, you know, those sins, they don't allow you to get in the kingdom of God. Because no sin, if you have any sins, is not going to allow you to get in the kingdom of God. That's why we need to be washed Amen. of all our sins. Drunkards is listed there. Being a drunk is a sin. Amen. Being a drunkard is a sin. Okay, it's case closed on that. And the Bible even says in, in chapter 5, you can flip one, one chapter back, 1 Corinthians 5.11 says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. Remember, be not among wine members. But now I've written unto you not to keep company if any man is called a brother, be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. With such an one, no, not to eat. So if you, have, you know a brother in Christ, and they're a drunk, they, they go out to the bar, and they get drunk, and everything else, and they're doing this repetitively, you're not even supposed to sit down and have a meal with that person. God's calling us out from that. Be not among the wine bibbers. We need to be separate because, look, these people, you could rebuke them, and that's fine, but you, you don't need to be buddy-buddy with them and going out to eat. They need to have some tough love. And unfortunately, when, and when it gets to this point, you see the sins that are listed here. When, when a Christian, when a brother is, is wrapped up in these sins, they need that tough love. They need to be outed. They need to just be, you know what? If you're going to be wicked, then go be wicked. But I'm not going to have anything to do with that because you need to get right with God. And I'm not going to be, you know, associating myself with you until you get right, until you could repent of that wickedness that you're doing and get right with God. And that's the way that we need to treat that. And that's what the Bible talks about for someone who's a drunk. So, pre, you know, it's pretty easy to prove that being drunk is a sin. Yeah. No one should be a drunkard. Getting drunk is not something that we should be doing because what is a drunkard? It's someone who gets drunk. Right? I mean, you could, you could argue, oh, well, I'm not doing it every day, so I'm not a drunkard. Look. If you're going out and drinking to get drunk, you're a drunkard. I don't care how often you're doing it. I really don't. Because where are you going to draw that line? Is it, is it every two days? Well, wait, maybe it's every three days. But not every four days. No. If you're going out and drinking and getting drunk, you're a drunkard. I don't care if you do it every week. I don't care if you do it once a month. Right. You're a drunkard. But it's more than just the drunkards that's, that's a sin. We've already established that there's positive and negative references to wine in the Bible. And when you look at the, the, the references, they're, they're, they're polar opposites. So the one saying how great it is and the other one saying how bad and poisonous is, those are two different beverages. Turn, if you would, back to Proverbs. we we'll look at Proverbs 23. And this is one of the main... I, I love this passage. I have this memorized. This section on wine and on alcohol. Because this provides a very clear description of, of, you know, of, of what alcohol will do. But it also gives us a good stern warning on how we should deal with this type of a beverage. <clears throat> Proverbs 23, at the end of, at the, end of the, the passage, we we'll start reading in verse 29. Proverbs 23, 29 reads, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Contentions is fighting. Who hath babbling? Is saying stupid things. Who hath wounds without cause? They, they get injured. They don't even know why. Who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine. They that go to seek mixed wine. So kids, you know, if you want to be real sad in your life, 
and just have woe and be crying and be depressed and just have a lot of sorrow and be fighting with people all the time and just saying a bunch of stupid things and just get wounds and get cuts and get scrapes and you don't even know why you got them then go ahead and drink alcohol because that's what it's going to do to you. Amen. When you drink the beer, when you drink the wine, you know, you're, you might grow up and have friends one day that are going to say, oh no, this is real fun. Oh, this makes us feel great. And it's such a fun thing. Remember what the Bible says. So you don't have to find out for yourself because the Bible is the truth. I can testify to this personally. This is 100% true. Drinking alcohol is going to bring you woe. It's going to bring you sorrow. You're going to do things you wish you'd never done. You're going to say things you wish you'd never said. You're going to think things you wish you'd never thought. When you allow this to become a part of your life, you're going to be looked on as a fool. Amen. Look at verse number 31. Because this is what we needed. This is, how are we going to keep ourselves from this? Verse 31. Look not thou upon the wine when it is red when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. Now again, it's talking about wine, but it's being more specific. That's why he's saying it's not just all wine, as in the good wine. He's saying, look not thou, don't even look at it. Don't look at the wine. He's not even talking about drinking. He's saying, don't look at it. Don't look upon the wine when it's red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. And... Again, without, no, without being an expert in the entire process, in order for the wine to become alcohol, I know this much, that the sugars are broken down and there's, there's a bacteria, there's a yeast in there that, that you know, eats, up, eats up the sugar, so to speak, and produces alcohol as an output. Well, it would make sense to me that while this is going on, you can, you know, it's moving itself aright. The, the, when the process is happening, this is not what you want to even be looking at. This is that bad wine that we need to just completely avoid 100%. Verse 32 says, at the last, does it sound familiar? It biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. An adder is just a, st a snake, right? When you get a snake bite, you get filled with poison. It's not good for you. It will kill you in many cases or will make you hurt and, you know, and debilitated. And, and this is what alcohol does. It's a very accurate depiction. It's like a snake bite. It's a poison. Look at verse 33. Thine eyes shall behold strange women and thine heart shall utter perverse things. I don't want to go too in depth on this, but th this, if you're married today, you are just, and, and even if you're not married, you are adding sin upon sin upon sin when you take that first drink of alcohol. Yeah. This is true. See, what, what happens is you start to lose your judgment and you start to lose control. You are feeding, you are adding so much fuel to the fire of your own flesh when you pour that, that alcohol down your throat. You think about, we, we struggle as Christians. We have a war daily. We battle our flesh. We have our spirit that wants us to do what's right and our flesh that wants us to sin and do what's wrong. Right? And just as much, we had that campfire last night. If I were to take a big gallon of gasoline and just dump it on that, you think about how much that flame would go up. Well, if you want your flesh to win that battle, you pour some booze down your throat and that'll do that the same effect of just going up in flames because you are going to completely quench your spirit and you are going to be magnifying the desires of your flesh and that's why you get these weird things because you know the works of the flesh are the adulteries and the fornications and and the wickedness and the, and, and it's that's what the, the Bible says when you drink alcohol look you're going to be looking on strange women women that are not your wife women that don't belong to you other people you'll be looking on them and thine heart shall utter perverse things you're going to be saying perverted things drink alcohol is going to make you a pervert you say perverted things and we'll get we'll actually get to that in a few minutes too because. Actually, I'll just, we'll get to that right now. Turn, if you would, to Habakkuk chapter 2. Well, let's keep reading. We'll finish off this chapter. Verse 34, sorry. 
We're going to go to Habakkuk 2. We'll finish off this passage. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. And that is the addictive nature of alcohol. Yeah. After all these bad things happen, you're doing all these wicked things, and you wake up and say, man, I kind of want to do that again. It's just totally foolish, and it makes no sense. But this is part of the dangers of alcohol. This is why I'm preaching strong against it today, because yeah, it doesn't make any sense. You'd be like, why would I want to do that again? Because that's the way that it is, and that's how it impacts you. And you don't even have to have a full explanation of why it's like that. It just is. Because it strengthens your flesh, and your flesh is just wants to do everything against God. Turn, if you would, to Habakkuk chapter 2. We talk, talk about making you a pervert. Because of these other effects alcohol has, you need to, to another reason to, to avoid it completely is because you will make yourself vulnerable. Now, the very first mention of wine in the Bible is Noah drinking wine, getting drunk, and passing out naked in his tent and his son abusing him. That's the very first reference of wine in the Bible, is Noah getting drunk and then being violated by somebody else. Just after that, we have the story of Lot. And if you remember from our Genesis series, what happened to Lot? Well, when they fled from Sodom and Gomorrah because it was so wicked, because they were drinking the wine of Sodom, as we read earlier, well, guess what Lot did? He brought, he took some of that, that, that wine of Sodom with him. The poison of dragons. And when he was left, you know, hiding out in his cave, his daughters got him drunk. Not once, but twice. In a row. Two nights in a row. They got him so drunk that he passed out asleep and had no idea of anything that happened the entire night. And his daughters came and violated him. And it was wickedness, extreme wicked, extremely wicked, filthy, disgusting, perverted things happened. And he was helpless against it. And you drink alcohol, it's going to make you, it could make you helpless. It could put you in a state where people can do whatever they want to you and you won't even know about it. You have no idea that that even happens. Look at Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 15. We'll see some of the perversion of alcohol in Habakkuk 2.15. The Bible says, Woe unto him, now notice the, the pronouns here, Woe unto him, that's a male, that giveth his neighbor drink, that puttest thy bottle to him. We're, all, we're talking about guys here. Right. A guy giving another guy drink, and makest him drunken also. So here's someone who's drunk, trying to get another guy drunk. Why? That thou mayest look on their nakedness. That's sick. It's perverted. But the Bible said in Proverbs 23, thine heart shall utter perverse things. Here's someone that gets drunk and now he's, 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 he's perverted. This is what alcohol will end up, could, could end up doing to you. Now turn, if you would, to John chapter 2. Because this is one of the most common arguments to excuse drinking in the Bible. People all, they'll say, you know what? No, 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 no. You can't be right about this because what about Jesus? What about Jesus? Jesus turned water into wine. I, and, and I've heard this justification and, you know, when, when I was, because I, I got saved when I was 20 years old. But I was still living a life of sin for a long time before I finally ended up getting right with God. Okay? And I wasn't stupid with a lot of scriptures. Now, I was, I was a babe in Christ. I didn't know a lot. But I wasn't an idiot and I knew that drinking was wrong and I knew, you know, I knew a lot of this stuff. But when you're in sin, you want to justify it to yourself. You want to try to excuse it somehow. And I didn't read enough. I didn't, like all, a lot of the passages we read today, I didn't know those. 
You know, I, I, didn't, I hadn't heard those. But it doesn't take a, you know, a rocket science to figure out all of the things that you do when you're drunk and, you know, and everything that happens just from experience. You know that's not right. right. You know that's not a, a wholesome way to live. You know that's not a moral way to live. You shouldn't be doing that. Okay, but this and this is what people do. You don't know the Bible at all. They say, well, you know, I've heard the story. I know Jesus made wine. Jesus turned water into wine. So that makes it okay, right? Well, let's look, let's look at this in John chapter 2. And here we're going to see why there, that's blasphemous Amen. to say that Jesus, that, 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 that the wine that Jesus made was an alcoholic beverage. But let's, let's look at this. Verse number 7 of John chapter 2. It says, Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. So, I mean, he, he gets them full. I mean, there is nothing left over in these pots. He gets them full to the brim. Because they ran it. Well, you know, we'll, we'll go back this a little bit. Um, just to get the whole story in context for you. Uh, verse number one, and in, the, and in the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage, and when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, or six of them, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece, Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and he saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk... Then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. So basically what happens is they had wine for the feast and they drank it all. It all ran out and they wanted more. So Jesus turned water into wine and we get this. This is all evidenced by what the, what the governor of the feast said. He's like, look, normally you put out the, the good stuff first. You know, the, the really nice taste, you know, like, like people enjoy it and like, wow, this is great. And then later that, which is worse, we saying like, this is the best, this is the best stuff I've ever had. I mean, this tastes great, right? This is great wine and you've kept it until now. That's amazing. And notice what he said. And when men have well drunk. So people there had well drunk and, and drunk there, it doesn't mean they're drunk in. It just means they had drunk it's a it's a it's a form of speech in the english language right drink drank drunk we had drunk so when they had drunk enough then you bring that which is worse so we already saw first of all we already put and this is why i wanted to prove that point drunkenness is a sin right. so you want me to believe that jesus christ god in the flesh was at a part was at a feast where everybody's getting drunk because men had well drunk. They didn't just have a glass. They had well drunk. In fact, they had well drunk so much that they ran them out of the wine that they had. That he's hanging out at this party. Everybody's getting drunk. And then they want more. They don't want the bar to close yet. So Jesus goes and makes a whole bunch more wine that just, here you go, drink up some more. When drunkenness is a sin. That Jesus is going to enable that. And perform a miracle for them to have that. That is ridiculous. Yep, yep. Absolutely ridiculous to even postulate that that might have been the case. And you say, well, Jesus' wine was an alcoholic, but the other one, no. They wouldn't have said that this wine is the good wine. And, and I forget the reference right now. I should, have, I should have put it in here. But it's, you know, there, there's a scripture in the Bible that says that, um, you know, he that, that drink at the old wine is going to say is... is He's not going to desire the new wine. He's going to desire the old wine. You know, when, when someone's at the bar and getting drunk, they're not going to want juice. They want more of the old wine. They want more of the same thing. They want more booze. They don't, they don't want the... the and, and I forget the reference to that. I should, I should have put it in here. But um, it doesn't matter. Because here, think about this now, though. Think about how this story starts off in John chapter 2. It says in verse 3, And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto them, They have no wine. 
Wanted means they lacked wine. They didn't have enough wine. They have no wine. And Jesus saith unto her, who said, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Jesus is talking about something different. He's not just talking about them being able to drink a, a glass of juice, right? He's saying, he's referencing something else. He's referencing his hour, his time to die, when he's going to shed his blood for mankind. Now, you remember that, again, the reference of Melchizedek when he brought bread and wine? Symbolic references of the body and blood of Christ. Jesus Christ is referencing the wine here as being his blood. Now, if the wine is alcoholic, what happens in the process? You use, I mentioned this earlier, the fermentation process, you're using yeast. Now, what's another, there's another process that uses fermentation, and that's making bread. It's a very similar process. When you're going to make some bread, you use leaven, right, for leavened bread which is the, the common bread that we, that we typically eat today, it has leaven in it. It has yeast. And there's that process that, you know, makes the dough multiply and rise and do all the things that it does with the bread. Now, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Because leaven in the Bible is always associated with sin, with impurity, right? And in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we'll see this. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6 says, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even, excuse me, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity, and truth. And he's telling you, get the leaven out of your life. Get the wickedness, get the sin out of your life. Because that's what it's representing here. And he mentions Christ our Passover. Now you don't have to turn there, but in Exodus 34, verse 25, the Bible says, Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven, neither shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left unto the morning. This is talking about the Passover ritual in Exodus when they would take the lamb and sacrifice it. But isn't it interesting? It says, Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven. It's talking about the blood. Now, if you have alcoholic wine, that is leavened wine. Jesus in this story is referencing his blood being shed. You think he made a beverage with leaven in it when he's referencing himself as the Passover lamb when the Bible says that the Passover don't offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven. No way. No way. Jesus Christ, that's why, that's why you have unleavened bread and unleavened wine to represent the body and blood of Jesus Christ because of his sinless perfection of being the, the pure lamb without spot to take away the sins of the world. If you add leaven to the bread, that's blasphemous against Jesus Christ because that's symbolizing sin in his life. And if you have fermented wine, you have leavened wine. And it's symbolizing then the exact same thing, that that, that blood is tainted. Jesus Christ's blood was not tainted. He did not serve alcohol here. He served unfermented juice, wine. This is what they drank. This is the good wine. This is not poison. This, this, this has plenty of benefits. And a lot of times when they do those studies with the benefits of drinking wine, you get the same exact benefits from drinking grape juice because that's what's bringing you the, the, the good stuff. It's not the alcohol content that's, that's making it good for you. It's the juice. It's the wine. It's the, you know, the, the true wine, the, the grapes, the, you know, whatever it is that you're drinking. That's what's bringing you the good stuff. And people will say, you know, um, to, uh, was it to Timothy, you know, use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and things like that. When you understand that there's two different wines in the Bible, it makes everything crystal clear. Right. 
it, 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 there's, no, there's no contradiction, and you can definitely get it by context. When it's using wine in a positive light, it's not alcoholic. And when it's using it in a negative, that's alcoholic beverage. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians 5. Last place we're going to turn. I know I said my last point was going to be explaining why the, the, it's blasphemous to even suggest um, you know, that we should be drinking alcoholic beverages. But um, in John chapter 2, you can see why that would be blasphemous to, to, to say that. If you're going to use that as your justification. But we need to have a proper view of sin in our life. Because I, I, you know, I don't know this, but I doubt that anyone here has a, has a struggle or problem with alcohol in their life. I don't think they do. Um, I, I, but I don't know everybody's lives individually. But we need to make sure we have a proper view of sin. Amen. Okay, now, what do I mean by this? I mean, don't be reveling in your glory days of, you know, oh man, I used, to, I used to drink this much, you know, and just be boasting and bragging about the wickedness that you partook in. That's something that I did when I was involved in that wickedness. And it's so stupid. It's so foolish. Yeah. To even be saying this because all you're doing is proclaiming and exalting how dumb you were. Yeah. And, and, but here's the thing. Don't be reliving that. Don't think of it in a light way as if, oh, I had so much fun doing this. That will lead you astray. That's going to be the first step yeah. into going right back down that path that you were on before that, that hopefully you've, you've forsaken already. And I, I'll tell you this, I, I made a promise to God, and I have not broken this promise to this date. When I quit drinking, I quit drinking. I vowed to God that I will never touch another drop of alcohol again as long as I live. And I made that promise to God, and I have not gone back on that, thank the Lord. But um, if I started thinking about these times in my past when, you know, I was, I was out and partying and, you know, whatever, and I started thinking about it in a positive light, do you know how easy it would be to just, have a, have a weak moment and get right back into that. We need to have the proper view. We need to see, and that's why we, I bring up these scriptures that talk about like the Habakkuk and how perverted it is and, and all the negative things because this, that's the reality of it. You're gonna, if you're thinking about this stuff in a positive light, you're deceiving yourself. You're not wise. You're being deceived by, by, the, by the, the, the fake pleasures that, that alcohol will bring you because it doesn't. It, it, it's going to bring you woe. It's going to bring you sorrow. But we also shouldn't even be joking about it either. It's not something that we need to, to treat lightly and, and um, you know, give all these jokes, oh, what are you, drunk? Or things like that. And I've heard this in church before and stuff too. And you know what? I might have even participated in it. But it's not right. Okay, so I'll tell you right now, if, if anyone's listening to me today and like, well, I heard you telling drunk jokes. Okay, that was a sin and it was wrong. We ought not to even be joking about it. Yeah. And here's a very good reason why. Because maybe you say, you know what? I'm never going to do it. I know that it's wicked. It's bad. I don't have a soft spot for it. But even when you do the foolish jesting, mm -hmm. which is not convenient, you know what's going to happen? There's going to be girls, like my little girls, are going to hear someone joking about it. And all of a sudden, it's not going to sound that bad. Because they're going to say something, and it might sound silly, it might sound funny, and they're not going to get the full understanding of how bad it really is. It's just like the way that they've exposed us to the sodomites. How did it start on the television? It starts off just making fun of them, right? Just making them the, you know, the, the guy that's, that's, oh, he's just weird and funny, right? And it's just a big joke. And it's just people just kind of mocking at the homo. And before you know it, now it's no, you need to accept this. But they make light of it. And that sin is disgusting. It ought not to be something that's even joked about. Because what you're doing is you're alleviating the importance and the weight of this. Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse number 3. But fornication... And all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. 
foolish talking as it'd be reveling in your old times when you used to be partying and doing all this stuff that was fun stuff or jesting, joking about it. Look, it's not convenient. This is not something you ought to be doing. You're, you're, you're alleviating the gravity of this sin because it's a, I mean, this is a type of sin that you, know, you break fellowship over. This is something that, that, that will literally ruin your life. And everybody, you know, people who are weak in the faith, whether it be children, whether it be someone who's new to church or whatever, they start hearing you talking about these things, they are not going to understand how serious this is. Right. And this is serious. And I hopefully I was able to demonstrate that so far today, this morning, of how bad drinking alcohol is for you. Now, I was trying to prove the point of the, the, the two different alcohols, but when we look at the negative references, especially like in Proverbs 23, it's bad. And it's not something you want to mess around with at all. Verse number 5, Ephesians 5 says, For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Amen. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Amen. Don't have this part of your conversation. If it is, it's a rebuke. Don't take it lightly. We need to have this view so that everybody can avoid it, not just you, but yourself also. Don't let that door start to open up even an inch of saying, well, it really wasn't that bad. Yes, it is. And that's something, you know, I'm no different than anyone else. I had the same desires. And, and even when I was trying to get right, before I got into church, when I was kind of trying to get right with God, and I would stop drinking for a while, and then, then some time would go by, and you know what? You forget the reasons why you even quit. You know, it starts to fade. You don't completely forget. You see, you start thinking, oh. And then you hear your friends talking about it because you're still among wine bibbers. And you're still, you know, thinking, oh, okay, well, maybe I will go out with you. Okay, well, you know, and guess what? You're right back where you started. It's a cycle. And that's, that's the way it works. The Bible says it. You don't have to take my word for it. I know that this, I know that this word is true. I know it's true because it's from God, but unfortunately, I had to learn the hard way about this subject. And if you haven't gone that route, don't, okay? I will testify personally unto you and give you more testimony if needed about how bad this is. But believe God's word. Amen. Because if you're a Christian, you should ought to have, you shouldn't even be looking at it. That's why I don't even walk down the booze aisle. When I'm at the grocery store, I go around. You say, but there's something I want right there. I'm going to go on the next aisle. I'm going to go down the frozen food aisle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then I'm going to get to the bread or whatever it is that I'm looking for. Okay? Don't even look at it. That's the, the, that's the, the mindset that we ought to have. And, and please keep your conversations pure and, and not going back to that, to that sinful weakness if that's something that you partook in in the past. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. God, I, I pray that um, what's been expressed today has been received well, dear Lord, and that people can see the difference between, between um, the good wine and the bad wine in the Bible, dear Lord, and why we ought to stay away from these things. Um, God, I thank you for giving me the power to, to be able to escape that that sinful condition, that, that wretched um, <clears throat> trap of being stuck in, in, uh, in, in that wickedness of, of alcohol, dear Lord, and drinking, dear Lord. I pray that you would please just, um, if anyone struggles with this, you'd help them to, to get over it and, um, and to, to get through it and just to, to think about these verses whenever the thought might ever pop up in someone's mind to, to even... Um, allow the possibility of, of going to the bottle, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help these verses to, 
to pop into our minds and make sure that we are kept straight and, and founded in your truth. And um, especially for the, for the younger ones that are here today, dear Lord, I pray that they would never have to make the same mistakes that I've made in my life. And uh, help us all to be diligent in our speech and in our conversations to make sure that, that, these, that these wicked sins are rebuked and that there is no doubt about how bad they are in their eyes, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.